Hello, everyone. I'm the Catholic Bible Geek. Welcome back to the channel. I uh, want to thank everybody for the new subscribers who popped in uh, because of the last couple of videos. I've been trying to, like, as I said, upload to this channel more frequently, and it's paying off. You know, I've got, gained quite a few subscribers, and welcome. Wonderful to see you. And uh, thanks for that. Thanks for the support. Thanks for sharing the, the videos of the ch channel. And I will cut this out and make its own video in, it the, in the playlist, the Bible survey playlist that I have. And I also want to thank those who have donated. I do have a PayPal link for donations to, again, help me to put more time into this channel than my other one, which is monetized. But I really do feel called for the ministry's sake to, to spend more time on this channel. People are responding well to it, seem to be blessing people, certainly blessing me. So that's great. So I do want to thank those who have been uh, been very generous in their support. And the link is below in the description or on the banner of the page if anybody else feels so obliged. But let's go ahead and go through tonight's content. So tonight we are talking about the patriarchs and it's a little bit of a misnomer to start calling it the patriarchs now because Abraham was the first of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are considered, uh, and then Jacob's 12 sons who become the 12 patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. And, you know, we'll, we'll see that as we go along. Now we're not going to cover as much as you might think, if you've heard other Bible stories, other Bible survey kind of courses or streams, this is one area that they tend to either skip over or they kind of really condense this a lot because this is where we get a lot of the history. We took a lot of time with Abraham and that's the Abrahamic covenant. That's important. And we see the DNA in the Abrahamic covenant for what would ultimately be the new covenant and, and uh, Christ coming to die for our sins. But uh we also see as this develops with the patriarchs, the reason they're called the patriarchs is because from Abraham to Isaac, we see this development from Isaac to Jacob. We see this development. Jacob's name is changed to Israel at one point, and then he has his 12 sons who become the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel, how that works. Other uh, people, when they go over this portion of the Bible, can go really in depth where they're because this is wonderful sermon material, right? You probably heard if you if you've gone to churches or, or masses or whatever, you've heard a lot of homilies or sermons coming from the, these material because it's very rich for for moral lessons. It's wonderful in that respect. But for the, our course, our, our purposes as a survey course, we can't go that in depth. So I'm trying to strike sort of a happy medium here. I am going to just really cover tonight, Isaac. And Jacob, to a certain degree, I'm going to take Jacob to a certain degree. I'm not going to take him too far because eventually when you get far in Jacob's life, you have to talk about his sons. And then obviously Joseph, which is the big, the big deal, big story, which caps out Genesis. So we really only have counting tonight two, maybe three, but maybe even two streams left in Genesis. And then we'll go ahead and start Exodus, the second book of the Bible. So we are moving along. As I said, we were going to spend a lot more time in Genesis than some other books. But, you know, the books will, will our time spent will, will wax and wane depending on the book and depending on uh, its usefulness to us to grasp a greater picture of the history of salvation and the, the picture of the Bible as a complete literary work, constant literary work. So Abraham, we already covered Abraham last time. He does, um, Sarah does pass away and he buries her in chapter 23 very sad moment, of course. And we saw in Abraham that he, Abraham failed a lot of tests God sent his way, but ultimately passed gloriously. Ultimately, he proved that he had such faith in God that he would not even withhold from God his only son, Isaac. And we talked about how that was a picture. We talked about the typology of Christ and so forth. So Abraham's continuing. Eventually, Sarah dies. And when we get to chapter 24, we're going to talk about Abraham arranging a marriage for his son, Isaac. But before we do that, I want to talk about and just recap this little chart that we've been kind of building on as we've gone through the chart of the covenants here. The Edemic covenant, the first covenant God made with humanity, with Adam and Eve. Adam was the mediator. His role was a husband. And the form of that covenant was marriage. Okay. And uh, we saw with, with uh, Noah automatically, we saw the, the sins against marriage, the sins against uh, the family, even that, that Ham uh, perpetrated upon Noah and, and his wife, you know, Ham's mother. But 
that Noahic covenant does deepen and uh, it deepens the covenant with Adam, fleshes it out even more to where the uh, role of the mediator was now not just a husband, but a father. And the form of that covenant became a household. In other words, a family, an immediate family. And then in Abrahamic covenant, we saw that that covenant was even deepened further and fleshed out further to where the mediator role was a chieftain of a tribe. And this is something that we don't, you know, especially in modern Western society, depending on what culture you come from, you might not think of tribe much, you know, but you can think of extended family. And even there, some of us are just pretty, pretty disassociated with extended family, not through any drama. It's just not something that uh, some of our some of the cultures in the, in the Western civilization here don't really keep touch with with big extended families so much anymore. But this was vital back in the day, tribe. And what we're seeing here as we look at this development through the covenants and as we tack on more covenants, we're seeing God develop his picture, readying the people throughout history and developing his picture for his ultimate goal, which is to save all the world. You know, ultimately, the new covenant will be for all the world, not just for a, a family or a tribe or a kingdom. It will be for a whole all, the, you know, all who would accept him. So we're going to see that develop a little bit. But reason I brought up this chart here is that I wanted to point out how these covenants are important. The forms of these covenants are important. Marriage, most of all, because marriage, you know, Jesus raised, elevated marriage to a sacrament and a sacrament. You know, it's one of the seven sacraments of the church. It's something that imparts the grace that it signifies, that it symbolizes, you know. A, a couple in, you know, when they recite their married vows and certainly consummating their their marriage, they, they literally receive graces from God in order to carry out their marriage. But what is that for? It's to constantly put others, put somebody else in front of their own needs to try to practice for the rest of their lives together, being selfless. And that, and that extends even more once the marriage becomes a family, once children are involved. Let me tell you about being selfless. Have a kid and <laughs> learn that real fast if you're a good parent, you know. So it's uh, so the, the nature of a family, it, it's there to impart the graces. It's symbolic. We've talked about that in the beginning of Genesis, how the even the, the married couple is symbolic. And then the, the child issuing forth out of their love is symbolic of the Trinity, symbolic of God and all of that. But there are actually graces imparted when you take it seriously and you draw upon God for those graces. So we're going to see here throughout this um this story here, the patriarchs, the problems that occur, and we've already seen the problems that occur against when you sin against the covenant of marriage. Uh, Abraham had some trouble with that quite a bit, right? Taking his uh, his wife's maid, uh, Hagar, and, and so forth, and, and some other things that he did as well. And then we've seen sins against the household, you know, with Ham sleeping or raping, basically. His mother, Noah's wife, you know, try to get uh, some, some prestige in place and take, take the birthright away from Shem and so forth. And we're going to see as well, there are consequences and problems that arise if you sin against the form of the tribe as we're going through the Old Testament and, and working our covenants up to the new covenant there. So one thing I'll point out about Isaac before I take the PowerPoint down and read just a little bit, but here we have some artwork. I believe that's from the Eastern Church. Looks looks somewhat Eastern, uh, but uh, I'm not you know, an expert on that. But we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob there. And uh, common themes that happen throughout these uh, these stories. We see common themes. Uh, sins against marriage cause trouble, like I said. You know, we, in, back in Genesis, uh, Lamech, the, the descendant of Cain, was the first to have two wives instead of just one. Covenant of marriage is only for one man and one woman. And he was the first to have two wives. And we see the, the sin developing in that line uh, to the point where we had the sons of men. We talked about the, the, the descendants of Cain who weren't really following God's laws, marrying the daughters of God the descendants of, uh, of of Abel or Seth there rather. So uh, those who would call upon the name of God. So uh, that, that uh, marrying somebody being unequally yoked, marrying somebody who's not right for you to join into that covenant with is causing problems. Abraham, obviously uh, telling uh, people in Egypt that Sarah was his sister and letting Pharaoh go so far as to try to take Sarah as his own wife. Uh, and then of course, laying with Hagar and so forth. Esau is going to run off and marry a Hittite woman, not the right woman for the tribe and so forth. And we're going to see that evolve with Jacob and Judah and so forth. Troubles with fertility is another uh, common theme that we'll talk about and we'll develop here a little bit as we go on tonight. But Eve didn't have trouble with fertility. But when Cain was taken from her, she did praise God for blessing her with Seth, you know, giving her another child to replace the one she'd lost. There's this sense of 
uh, well, we'll talk about it in a moment, but there's this sense of being fruitful back to God for his blessings. And that's uh, quite literally being fruitful in terms of following his commandment, be fruitful and multiply. But it's also symbolic of being faithful to his commandments and giving back, bearing fruit with that which he's given you. So uh, troubles with fertility, we'll see that. And then there's also a common theme of favored sons. And uh, favored sons, sometimes the uh, quite often the younger will will end up being chosen over the older. Uh, we'll see that, but we see that with uh, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Joseph, and so forth. So just some themes to, to mention, and to, I'll probably pull those up at the start of the next stream too, just to keep us on track with that. But we're starting with Isaac, and it's important to realize that Isaac, and this is the same Isaac who Abraham was commanded to sacrifice to God. And remember, we talked about this is the same Isaac who would have been about a teenager at that time and went willingly, was a type of Christ, carried the wood for the sacrifice on his back, went up to the mountain, most likely the very same mountain or at least one of the mountain range there that Christ was sacrificed upon, was a willing sacrifice. And we talked about the typology of that. So Isaac is, is someone that's already shown a lot of character here. And we'll talk about his marriage here in a second, but for Isaac, he's the only of the only only one of these patriarchs from from uh, Abraham to, to Jacob, who does not sin against the covenant of marriage. He comes close at one point, he's tempted to, but he does not sin against the covenant of marriage, as we'll see. And because of this, he's blessed. He's richly blessed, as we'll see. And as I'm talking and I'm seeing the clock go, it might just be that we cover just about <laughs> just a little bit of Isaac here, maybe a touch on Jacob tonight. But it's good that we're doing this. We're covering the important points. Abraham decides that Isaac needs a wife. Sarah has passed away. Isaac is about 40-ish at this point. And I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 24. Oh, yeah, thank you, Santa Graver. I did mean when Abel was taken from Eve. Um, Cain was taken too in exile, but I did mean Abel. So, yeah. Uh, chapter 24, Genesis. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by my Lord, the God of heaven and of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Weird scene here, right? So Abraham calls the eldest uh, servant, sometimes tradition calls him Eleazar. We don't have his name here in uh, in Genesis, but we have uh, this oldest servant, most seniority, you know, servant kind of runs the household. And Abraham charges him with finding a, a wife for his son, Isaac. Abraham's getting older. He knows he doesn't have too much time left, although we'll see Abraham does get remarried. <laughs> he gets remarried and has even more children after Sarah died. A lot of people don't realize that, but, you know, pretty. Uh, he's, he's making good on the promise that God gave him that he would be a father, a, you know, exalted father, a, a father of uh, many nations, you know, multiple, multiple times over. So Abraham calls his servant and tells him, put your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear this, this uh, oath. And that's a weird thing to do. Put your hand under my thigh. What is that? And there've been a lot of, uh, a lot of investigations into that. And people do look at the word that's used for thigh, the Hebrew word, and that word is used for a bunch of different things. One of the things it's used for is loins, you know, that, uh, that, that Adam, you know, his uh, descendants would spring from his loins, you know, and stuff like that. Basically, genitals is basically another word for it here. And I'm of the mind with, with most people that, yeah, that's basically the kind of oath this is talking about. We do see it used in like this way in a couple different uh, places in the Bible. And it's not, it sounds really weird to our ears, really like put your hand where, <laughs> you know, it's nothing like that. What's going on here is the oath is on. This is how serious Abraham takes God's covenant with him and how serious Abraham takes marriage and knowing that Isaac can't be wed to one of these Canaanite women who have different, different religions. You're not going to follow, you know, be tempted to pull him away from God. He wants Isaac to take a wife from his own people as Abraham did. So he's, uh, he's swearing upon his, thigh, if you will, the servant swears upon that, upon the progeny. It's a very serious oath. This is the you know, Abraham, the great chieftain, the great you know patriarch, even at this point, very powerful man. You're swearing on his own virility. You're swearing on your master's lineage, his uh, heredity, his, uh, yeah, his lineage, his, his um, virility. That, that's, that's a major oath. So as weird as it sounds to us, 
it's a heavy oath. And uh, the servant s- swears, yes, I will. I will take uh, I will take nobody but uh, you know a wife for, for Isaac from from this land. Now, we have a wonderful story here that it would be great to go into and uh, and really dwell on. But again, for our sake, we have to keep rolling. But we have here, uh, the Abraham's servant goes back to the land where Abraham's family is, and he's praying on the way, and he says, God, let, let the one at the well whom I uh, asked to, dwell, to draw water for me, the one who says, yes, she will, let that be the one. And as the servant is approaching, it says, "Behold!" Uh, before he had done speaking to God, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar upon her shoulder. The maiden was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they have done drinking. We're going to talk about this more when we do. You know, we already covered John a little bit in my study of John, that was going through for a time. But in this context of this survey through the Bible, once we do get to the book of John in the New Testament and we look at Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well, there are echoes of this. We're going to see that uh, that's referencing this story here in a lot of different ways. Rebecca, though, is a just picture of total uh, purity and obedience to God, uh, wonderful hospitality. Not only will she give this servant a drink, being hospitable, she'll also even draw for his camels. That's a huge deal. Camels, if they're thirsty, they can drink up to like 25 gallons, uh, if I remember correctly. I'm not good at remembering numbers, but I think that's about it. You can imagine how many jars she's drawing from the well here at this point just to water all of these camels for the man. That's no light endeavor. She's truly being hospitable, truly being a good, you know, hospitable person, hostess. And the well is also symbol, uh, symbolic. You remember that Jesus talks about uh, the living water that he will he will give for people to drink. But the well is that symbol. It's a life giving water. And uh, of course, we'll we'll eventually get the living water of the gospel of Christ himself and so forth. But it is symbolic. And we'll see that with Isaac. Isaac goes around later in his life digging a lot of wells. We'll look at a little bit of that here uh, as we go through. So the servant does reveal to Rebecca that he's looking for a wife for his master's son and gives her a gold ring, gives her some gifts and whatnot. And is uh, she invites him to come back to her home. He asked if he may stay there as well. And her brother, Laban, we're going to see Laban later. He deals with Isaac, <laughs> Rebecca's son later. But Laban is, uh, you know, the, the, the money signs start going off in his head when he sees all these gifts that the servant has given his sister, Rebecca. And Laban runs out to meet the servant. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, wonderful. Come in, come in, come in. Let's be friends, you rich person. You know, <laughs> And uh, we're going to see that, that Laban stays in character for that quite a bit. But they do agree that Rebecca will go back and be the wife of Isaac. Now, I'll read this a um, little bit here as Rebecca's heading back with the servant, back to Abraham's home. Isaac was very close to his mother, and uh, Isaac took the death of his mother pretty harshly. And uh, at one point it says here, now Isaac had come from Beer. Um, Sorry, I get the pronunciation wrong. He was dwelling in Nagab, and Isaac went out to the uh, to meditate in the field in the evening. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she alighted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man yonder walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done, then Isaac brought her into the tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Beautiful story. And again, we could go far more deeply into that uh, for a wonderful lesson on courtship and marriage and so forth. But just a beautiful picture right off the bat. This this pure holy woman, you know, the God chosen for Isaac is on her way back. And she sees Isaac in the distance. And she's a little smitten with Isaac. Hey, who, who's that? And once she realizes he's to be her husband, she covers herself with a veil, this modesty, and uh, and goes up to him. And just that, you know, he uh, she became his wife and he loved her. And, and that really is the the key to a lot of Isaac's success here is, is taking seriously the covenant of marriage, 
and and what that means for him, of course, is also taking seriously God's covenant with him through his father Abraham, as we'll get to in a moment here. So, uh, so important stuff. We'll, we'll we'll come back to to we'll, we'll I'm just going in order of the of the narration, but we will get back to Isaac in a moment. But eventually, we'll talk about Isaac's children, Isaac and Rebecca marry, and at first. Isaac prayed to the Lord. This is uh, chapter 25, verse 23. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So another instance of a woman being barren. And this, this, uh, and we've had, we've had, as I said, uh, Sarah and uh, we'll, we'll have, we have Rebecca, we'll have Jacob and uh, Jacob's wisely and Rachel and so forth later dealing with being barren. And as I said, God did say, be fruitful and multiply. So to, to have children is to um, follow that commandment, but it's also a, and, and I think we need to understand that more today, right? Especially, I mean, uh, my priest today just gave a wonderful homily talking about abortion and, and, and uh, calling evil or good evil and evil good and, and whatnot. And we need to understand that, yes, quite literally on this level, be fruitful and multiply here is a literal commandment and then it, i'm going to talk about the symbolism in a moment but i don't want to negate that that the literal significance of that it is that to be fruitful to have children is is an incredible blessing and our culture looks at it as though it's not oh my gosh children a goodbye to your life and that betrays the heart of our modern day society which says hold on to your wants your needs hold on to your schedule hold on to your 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 and, and couples, oh, we're waiting because we just want to do what we want for a while. Now, there's nothing wrong in principle with having hobbies, with having a schedule, with having, of course not. But there is something wrong with putting yourself before others. And the blessing of children, as I've said, as is the blessing of marriage, is it forces you, not in a torturous way, because you love these people, you want to do it. If you're growing in, in faith and growing in holiness the, the proper way. And it's not to say it's still easy. You need those graces from God to do it. But the family, the marriage, and then the family, and in the Old Testament, even the tribe and the responsibility of the tribe is a means of teaching us to lay down our lives for others and to, to take on that Christ-like love. So there's that. There's also the symbolic nature of it in that God gives us, you know, Jesus talks about he's the vine and we are the branches and we are supposed to bear him fruit. Now that means that that means being obedient. That means growing in our walk of holiness, you know, so we are to bear fruit. One of the things I think about every Sunday as I partake of the Eucharist and I'm meditating over that is, is God help me to bear fruit from this, you know, uh, Christ going into our bodies and, and we're supposed to bear something just like a woman bears a child from, from the marital act. Uh, you know, we're supposed to bear fruit in our lives and uh, that's, that's our own growth. That's our own works. You know, that's our, anything like that being faithful, to God's call for us in particular. So, uh, so, you know, that's why we see this, this common theme of barrenness and God blessing women with children. So he, uh, Rebecca conceives, God answers the prayer. The children struggled together within her. She has twins. She's blessed with twins and the two are struggling in her womb, very difficult pregnancy. And she said, if it is thus, why do I live? I mean, it's really bad. It's like, I, I can't even handle, I can't even live with this. So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people, two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her days uh, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came forth red, all his body, like a hairy mantle. So they called his name Esau, which basically means hairy. <laughs> Afterward, his brother came forth, and his hand had taken hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, which means heel grabber, has come to mean deceiver, and so forth. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. All right, so uh, we, we have these two children, and as the prophecy says, the older shall serve the younger. So again, this is going to be an instance of the younger getting the birthright, as we'll see here, or the blessing, and so forth. And I'll just go a little bit farther with this. Um, yeah, we're good. Good on time. Um uh, yeah, I'll go a little bit farther with this. So as eight, Jacob and Esau are growing, as they grow, uh, chapter, uh, verse 27, chapter 25, verse 27, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau 
because he ate of his game. But Rebecca loved Jacob, so we've got some favoritism going on there. Once when Jacob was boiling pottage, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red pottage, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. Uh, it means red. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. All right, what are we talking about here with birthright? What we're talking about here is not the same thing as the blessing that we'll see Isaac give here in a moment. It's tied together. The two are related. But birthright here means the covenant. Stories would have been told, right? They know their grandfather Abraham received all of these promises from God and that it was through Isaac, not through Ishmael, not through his brother, not through Uncle Ishmael, that this was going to be, uh, these promises were going to be delivered upon, but through Isaac. So Isaac has two sons. Which of those sons is the, are these promises going to be delivered through, right? This is a, it's a valid question. And tradition, custom would say the older, even of twins, the firstborn was Esau. But it says Esau despised his birthright, and we see it there. I mean, Esau comes in from the valley. Okay, he's very hungry. You're not literally going to die, dude. Very hungry, just wants some of the food that Jacob's preparing and says, uh, give me that. And, and Jacob, give me, your, give me your birthright, you know. And Esau doesn't, Esau, sure, take it, whatever. Just, just give me the food. Esau hears all these stories, you can imagine, about promises given to Abraham and all this. Life, and Esau doesn't care about it. Esau, it says, despises his birthright. It's not something he's worried about. He'll want the blessing. As we see in a moment, he'll want Abraham's blessing. He'll want himself to prosper and to, and to live a great life, but he's not worried in, in pleasing this God or, or, you know, he despises that birthright. He despises the talk of it. And, and this is why we see Esau becoming the type of person he is and his descendants becoming the type of person, they, people they, they'll become, you know, as, as in relation to Israel here. And the, the narrative in chapter 26, I am going to take a little bit more time to do this because I think it's important. The narrative in chapter 26 returns to Isaac now. So Jacob and Esau are his children, but Isaac is still around, he and Rebecca. And Isaac chapter 26 says, uh, Now there was a famine in the land, besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Remember, the Philistines were people coming from Ham, the, the one who was cursed, you know, his son Canaan, and so forth. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. So the Lord appealed to, Egypt, to Isaac, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you for you to be uh, and to your descendants. I will give all these lands and I will fulfill the oaths which I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your descendants at the stars of the heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So we find here that Isaac is facing a situation very similar to Isaac here, very similar to what his uh, his serv uh, his father Abraham did. Was called out to live in this land, and there's a famine in the land, so he has to go somewhere. And God tells him, "Don't go to Egypt like your father did. Go to this other land that I'll show you, which ends up being the land of the Philistines." And God tells him as he before he goes in there, he says, I'll bless you. I'll bless you as I did your father Abraham because your father Abraham obeyed me. Now, we saw that Abraham didn't always succeed in obeying God. But as I said, in the end, he finally grew in his walk and grew in his faith and came through wonderfully, amazingly. A Isaac is being tested here a little bit. So just as Abraham was called out to another land to take his wife and his family out to another land, so is Isaac here. And in chapter 25, verse 6, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me for the sake of Rebekah. Sound familiar? Because she was fair to look upon. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech's king of the Philistines, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw Isaac fondling Rebekah his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? 
Isaac said to him, because I thought lest I die because of her. In other words, she would be so beautiful, people would kill Isaac to make Rebekah their wife. And Rebekah was supposed to be very beautiful. Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife. You would have uh, brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, whoever touches this man or, this, or his wife shall be put to death. We see the, the uh, and then God goes on to bless Isaac there, wonderfully. God blesses Isaac so much so that Abimelech says to Isaac, you got to go away now. You're getting, you're, you're too strong. You're much bigger than us. You're mightier than we, so you've got to go away. And Isaac goes around digging wells. And I said that Isaac is the only one of the patriarchs not to sin against marriage. This is where he's tempted and comes close, comes close by announcing to people that Rebecca is his sister rather than his wife. And that's a lack of faith, as we saw in Abraham, a lack of faith that God would protect. God's just told Isaac, I'm going to bless you mightily. And the first thing Isaac does is fear for his life. So tell people that his wife is his sister. But he doesn't let it go as far as Abraham did. Abraham let it go so far to where Pharaoh was taking was about to take Sarah as his own wife. We don't see Isaac let it go that far. In fact, we see the king of the Philistines look out the window and see Isaac fondling his wife. I don't know if he's, you know, tapping her on the tush or what, you know, but caressing her in a, in a very unsisterly like manner, you know, uh, th th this is, this is, 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 is obvious. So Isaac couldn't have been that, that sold into the deceit. And certainly I think the text is, is pointing to the fact that he wouldn't have gone as far as Abraham did and really let Rebecca be in danger of another man laying with her or taking her as their wife, as, as uh, Abraham did with, with Pharaoh and so forth. And because of that, we see Isaac blessed in this land, blessed so much that he's asked to leave. And then remember, God came to him first and said, I'll bless you. I'll do all these things because your father who obeyed me. Then God comes to Isaac afterward, after all of this, because Isaac's passed the test, you know, came close, but he passed the test. And in uh, verse 23, from there, he went up to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him and she in the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and so forth. So it's he gets the seal of approval, right? This is Isaac's test. And Isaac ultimately passes it, passes it, right? You know, maybe some marks off here, there, you know, but, but, but he ultimately passes it. And this is why Isaac's blessed. And even after that, Abimelech comes to him, the king of the Philistines. And says, look, let's just make a covenant because it's clear that the Lord is with you. It's clear that God is blessing you. Let's just make a, 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 a contract between the two of us, a treaty, basically, that you won't harm us. And we, we haven't harmed you. We won't harm you. You could see that going very differently. And I think it probably would have had Isaac not been obedient to God. God would have had to teach Isaac obedience as he had to teach Abraham. But Isaac's a special character here, a special one of the patriarchs, because he doesn't have those same failings, those same lacks of faith, those same... Um, sins against the covenant of marriage, family, tribe, and so forth. So end up, uh, we'll end up here with, uh, check the time. I wanted to go a little farther, but I think we're going to go ahead and end now. We'll, we'll, we'll come into Isaac and Jacob uh, next week and look at the blessing and everything like that. So it might take us a couple more weeks to get through Genesis, but we will do so. Uh, there and remove that. So yeah. Uh, that's where we'll stop tonight, just for time's sake. I want to keep these short. But uh, thanks, for you guys, for hanging out with us. And I'll check the, the chat here for questions and whatnot. But we're we're developing this picture, as, as we see, and we'll continue to develop it with Jacob and Esau. Uh, yeah, the Bible does have wonderful stories. Go team, go Planet go. And uh, Sonny Graver says, the I wish this story of Jacob and Esau was fleshed out in Sunday school. <laughs> as a kid, I thought Jacob treated Esau dirty. I never understood the context of God's covenant until much later. It's a good point. I mean, Jacob is, he's deceiving Esau, but not really deceiving. You know, he's not, he's not pulling the wool over his eyes here anyway. We're going to see Jacob deceive Isaac here in a bit. But in, in this, in this interaction before the birthright, he straight up says, give me your birthright and I'll give you the food. There's no, there's no deceit there. Esau could have said no, but Esau despised his birthright. So, so far that's, that's what's going on now. Uh, Jin Yu, thanks for the person. Oh, thank you. I'm gl glad it's glad it's uh, a good treasure for you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sorry we can't keep going. I'd love to, to go farther, but I want to keep these relatively short and weekly and, and uh, keeping them short ensures that I'll keep them weekly. <laughs> so next week we'll come back and really dig into Jacob's life uh, and, and the blessing, stealing the blessing from Isaac and so forth and Jacob's, uh, Jacob's development of his own family. So, um,
Oh, you didn't mean deceit. You just meant treating him dirty. Yeah. I think I said deceit sounded graver because people always say that Jacob is the deceiver. So I kind of went there for that. But yeah, Sunday school makes Esau the victim here. You're right. And that's not the case. Esau is uh, Esau is not really taking seriously the things of God here. So yeah, good point. Good point. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for hanging out. We'll be back again on Tuesday this week on this channel, Al and I, to continue our study of the return of the king. Uh, I forget which chapters we're looking at. The ride of the Rohirrim is one of them. And then the next chapter, six and seven or five and six. I don't know. Forgot. But anyway, that's there. So um, we'll be back with that. And then I'll be back with some regular content. And I will put this video out uh, probably tomorrow night, cut out this stream into its own video and put it out tomorrow night and make it part of that playlist and then be back with uh, with much more this week. So thank you all so much. Again, new subscribers, those who are going to watch the stream later, thank you very much for your support and uh, and just being around and subscribing. Wonderful. Appreciate it. Every little every little thing you do helps. And, uh, and we'll pray that this message and the teaching and that more people can be uh, exposed to the Bible. More Catholics can dig into their Bibles as they need to, <laughs> but more, uh, more Protestants, as I've talked about, can can be uh, exposed to the fact that, hey, Catholics don't hate the Bible. Catholics are pretty, pretty okay about the Bible. <laughs> and then we'll keep going from there. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to go rest now and veg. Uh, but until next time, God bless.